Good morning from Chicago, compassionate friends. Welcome to the Council for a Parliament of the World's Religions special webinar with John Raymer, Director of the Compassion Games, Survival of the Kindest. My name is Molly Horan, and I coordinate communications for the Parliament of the World's Religions and for our Faiths Against Hate campaign. The mission of this campaign is to transform the elements of fear, anger, and hate in our culture into neighborly, loving relationships. There is no project that embodies this most possible dream any more than Karen Armstrong's Charter for Compassion. As one of its most passionate champions, John Raymer is surely doing it justice. How lovely to see so many of you ready to participate in the Compassion Games. I am sure you are excited to hear what John has to say this morning, so I will gladly ask him to speak after sharing a little bit about him. John Raymer is an American entrepreneur, civic leader, inventor, and musician. He is co-founder of several technology companies, including Raymer & Associates, Elf Technologies, whose main solution, Serengeti, was purchased by Thomson Reuters, and Smart Channels. The designer and co-founder of several deep social networks, he is the former executive director of the Intera Project and a co-founder of Ideal Network, a group buying social enterprise that donates a percentage of every purchase to a nonprofit or school. Ideal Network is a certified B Corp that was recognized as best in the world for community in 2012 by B Labs. He is also the designer and co-founder of Compassionate Action Network International, a 501c3 organization based in Seattle that led the effort to make the city the first in the world to affirm Karen Armstrong's Charter for Compassion. Most recently, Raymer conceived of and produced the Compassion Games Survival of the Kindest in response to a challenge from the mayor of Louisville to other cities to outdo Louisville's compassionate action as measured by hours of community service. Raymer also serves as Director and Chief Technology Officer at Four Winds International Institute with a focus on the campaign to protect the sacred. The campaign birthed the International Treaty to Protect the Sacred from Tar Sands Project, signed over by 50 different tribes throughout North America. Raymer is also the songwriter and lead guitarist in the band Once and For All. And with that, we have a living superhero ready to talk with you about compassion. John, how are you doing this morning out in Seattle? Hi, Molly. I'm doing great. I'm so grateful. To the webinar and looking forward to this time together. And now hopefully you Good see morning. the mountain that we're all climbing together. We do. You guys see. From all the right. golden rule to golden reality. That's right. That's right. All right. So I'm going to give you an overview of the work we've been doing in Seattle and a little bit more about the Compassion Games and then make it available for anybody to interact with us and ask questions and hopefully get engaged and get the game on here. We've got a big challenge in front of us. The world is calling. And this is what happened here in Seattle. It was actually in 2008. We had the good fortune to host His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu and many other luminaries for a five-day event that was the largest event in the history of the state of uh, Washington. Dave Matthews, who lives here, is a famous fist bump between uh, the Dalai Lama and Dave Matthews. It was a really incredible gift to the community. And that same year that we had this five-day event, Karen Armstrong was the winner of the TED Prize. I'm assuming if you're watching a webinar like this, you probably all seen TED Talks. Well, once a year they also give out a TED Prize. And like to Bono and Bill Clinton and Karen, the religious scholar that she is, when she won the TED Prize, you're given one wish to change the world and her wish was to implement globally the golden rule. And we thought that was a great idea. At that same event too though, which happened, um, we met Chief Phil Lane Jr., hereditary Chief Phil Lane. And that's really important. I mean, the name of the city of Seattle comes from a Duwamish chief. And so much of the work that I think all of us are doing is locally rooted. So it's like that word glocal, you know, global and local together. So for us, it's so important that any expression of compassion take into consideration the real pain and suffering and challenges faced within the tribes and within the bonds that are being created in this unprecedented unified action that's coming together now really to protect the sacred, the challenges to Mother Earth are such, and the wisdom of indigenous people is such an important part of the work that we're doing. In fact, on this little paper that Phil and I wrote, um, there were 40 years prior to Phil and I meeting of consultation amongst indigenous leaders 
that led to this summary statement that's at the core of really all the work that we do, the statement that says starting from within, working in a circle, in a sacred manner, we develop and heal ourselves, our relationships in the world. And for us, this work, although it's very focused on serving others, it really is an inside job. In the end, for it to really be authentic and for it to really have resonance with people, we've had to challenge ourselves to walk this path. And by walking this path, the path becomes visible. And um, that's one of the things I'm most proud of is the healing and the relationships that we're building that's intergenerational and cross-cultural. So the work with Phil Lane has been and continues to be instrumental in what we're doing. So after the Charter for Compassion was then unveiled a year later in 2009, I had the good fortune to see a video that I'm going to show you. And it's a short video. It's in fact everything you need to know about how to make a movement in three minutes. And it's so simple, but yet really profound. And um, you'll see in a minute when Molly, you introduced me, I think you introduced me as the founder, or I don't remember the exact title, but actually my playing card, I don't have a business card, but my playing card says under my name that I'm the first, first follower. And I think after you see this video, you'll understand why. So hold on, let me click on this, and let me start this video. All right, hold on. All right, so let me see how to make this thing start from the beginning. Here we go. This is everything you need to know about how to make a movement in three minutes. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over-glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. Oh my gosh, okay, well that's the whole thing is that narrative. Because the point of that video is that the leader that you see, the shirtless dancing guy, the lone nut as he's described, it's the first follower that turns that lone nut into a leader. 
And the point is that leadership is over-glorified. And if we really want to make a movement, it takes that first follower. And then what happens is the next followers, they don't follow the leader, they follow the first follower. So this is a beautiful expression, this leadership lessons from the dancing guy. If you guys were not able to hear the voiceover that really um, illuminates what's happening there in a simple way, I encourage you to, to see that. This is so much the case of what's happened here in Seattle. Because although we were, you see this next little slide here, we ran this campaign after we were inspired by that idea and by Karen Armstrong. We went to our city council and to our mayor and said to them, if we could get a thousand people to pledge time, talent, and treasure to help others meet their basic human needs, would Seattle become the first city to affirm the Charter for Compassion? I'm sure they didn't understand really what I was saying, but they were willing to play along and sure enough that happened. And then it was uncharacteristic of our city council and mayor, but they actually issued a joint proclamation. And we kicked off this, oh boy, I don't know why that just happened, sorry guys. But we kicked off this 10 year campaign for compassionate cities. And that was the birth of our movement here in Seattle. Wow, okay. Prezi's behaving in ways I've never seen Prezi behave before. Sorry guys. <laughs> Hold on here. I guess we're having some technical challenges. All right, let's see. Wow, this is inspiring. Let's try this again. So that was that video is available. I love anybody who's really interested in this topic, and I bet the folks that are on this video are watching this webinar. Let me go back up here and see if I can get this thing to work properly. And that lesson was a very instructive one for us about really how one builds a movement and what's necessary to inspire others and to really get beyond oneself. I mean, everyone's got their own great ideas, but I realize that so many of these great ideas, what they just need is people who are willing to jump in and get behind them. So let's see, this is the joint proclamation. Hopefully we're not gonna race your head. Yep, okay. So this launched this 10 year campaign for Compassionate Cities. And we've used rhythmically the cycles of April and October, plant seeds in April, and harvest them in October. And that's kind of been the pattern we followed. Now the truth is when we said we were going to become the first city to affirm the Charter for Compassion and launch this 10-year campaign to become a Compassion City, we had no idea what that means. In fact, I don't know that I have any idea today what that means. It's a challenging question and it really is more powerful as a question than an answer. It's one of those things you kind of can sense when you see it. We knew that there's so much good going on in our community. So we worked on creating this uh, idea of a heart map. Some of you may have seen this. It's on the Compassionate Seattle site. Because one of the things we wanted to do is connect the things that are already working in the community and become more aware and strengthen their presence in the community by connecting them. So that was one of the first things we did. And then I ran across an article from the Stanford Social Innovation Review on this idea of collective impact. And they said that the problems that the, that the world is facing are just too great for any one organization or institution. That government won't be able to fix the problems we face, and business won't be able to, and nonprofits and educational institutions. We need to learn how to come together to create this collective impact. And that resonated with me. And the five points are what's identified here. These are what they said is necessary in order to create collective impact. A shared vision some way to measure, you know, that's often very important to some folks, is how do you know you're making progress? and How can you demonstrate that you are, in fact, moving towards that goal? So a shared measurement system, the mutually reinforcing activities, so that, again, this is a good example of how we work together. So we're not just about our own thing. I mean, one of the biggest challenges we face when we get together is everybody's so focused on their thing, and that's good for their thing, but what about the whole? This is one of the challenges. In fact, I learned years ago about what's known as the social dilemma. And the social dilemma is defined by academics as rational, individual choices that lead to poor group outcomes. All right, my computer is working on its own. So rational, individual choices that lead to poor outcomes. And part of the challenge, a way to overcome that with collective impact, 
is to be able to look at these mutually reinforcing activities. You need communication between all those parties and you need some platform to make that happen. These are those conditions that were necessary as identified by the Stanford Social Innovation Review to create collective impact. So we said, that's a great idea. Didn't know how to do it either, though. And then what happened was this campaign, when we launched it, we invited other cities around the world to get involved. And many cities have, in fact, and then Oprah just recently, um, Karen was on Oprah, and she'll be talking about the charter in her second segment. But as you can see, a long list of cities emerged. And probably now there's only 200 cities around the world that are following not just our lead, but remember one of our first followers was Louisville. And so many of the cities that have come to us now have really come to us through Louisville because remember in the video I was saying that the next followers don't follow the leader as much as they follow the first follower. And we were really fortunate that the city of Louisville, which is an incredible place, I did not realize. I was surprised at first. It's this blue dot in this red sea and the northernmost southern city and the southernmost northern city. My gosh, they've been doing interfaith work for years and years and years, Thomas. Merton had his uh, uh, abbey there, and Muhammad Ali is based there, and they have this incredible mayor who's a business guy who decided that um, he'd accept everyone's call for him to be mayor, and he ran on three points, lifelong learning, health, and health in all domains, not just physical health, spiritual, emotional health, and compassion, and he won. And not only did he win on that platform, he governs on that platform. And he was so great. He came out because we were so impressed with the work that they've done in Louisville that we brought him and his team out to Seattle to give them an award and to honor them for their work. And they turned around and challenged us. And that's the roots of the Compassion Games. They said that they were the most compassionate city in the world and would be so until proven otherwise. And here's the letter I received. And on the last part of the letter, you can see here, Mayor Fisher says, wouldn't it the world be a better place if cities were in competition with each other to show they are more compassionate. Well, I thought that was another great idea, something that we could follow. So last year, in 2012, we said game on. And we took on uh, the city of Louisville. And at that time, we had these four basic ideas of doing service projects and random acts of kindness. And we played the compassion games last year. I went out a few months after to settle the score with the mayor, and we agreed that last year was a draw. But we also agreed that we were going to continue the play. So this year, and in the years going ahead, we decided to put the Compassion Games between September 11th and September 21st, again to support things that were already working. It was already in place, these 11 days of global unity. So the games take place from September 11th to the 21st. That's a week from today. So you can imagine we're all excited, and there's now 18 other, there are 18 communities, 17 other communities that are participating with us. They're not all identified here. We haven't had a chance to update the Prezi, but Los Angeles, Orange County really, Sandy Hart is awesome. And she, with the support from Rebecca, have really spread the word throughout the state of California. They're creating a whole state of compassion there. So you got Long Beach and you got Huntington Beach and you've got Los Angeles and Orange County and San Francisco. But you also have New York City and Nashville and Milwaukee and Houston and Dallas and Winston-Salem, North Carolina and Montreal, Canada and Newfoundland and Gurgaon, India. I mean, all the communities that uh, have been playing together are participating in what we call a co-opetition. So the idea of a co-opetition is we're cooperating to compete. And the roots of the word competition go back to the word competere, which actually means to strive together. So the reframe here about games and competition is that we're not competing against each other, we're competing with each other. And in doing so, we've been having these weekly calls in which we're sharing with each other our best ideas and best practices on how to create these kinds of expressions of and promotion of compassionate action. So the four steps to play the compassion games are really very simple. You can either be a player, and anybody can play no matter where you are, and anybody can play any day of the year. In fact, like Sandy taught us in um, California, that they could do the trials in anticipation of the games. And we're going to be doing that same cycle in the years to come. 
So the four steps of this, you commit either to be a player or to be a, an organizer. And people have picked up the mantle to organize games within their community or to organize their entire community. So folks can participate by committing to either be a player or organizer. Then we have a number of games. There are secret agents of compassion. And we're so fortunate to have, living in Seattle, one of the real masters of teaching kindness and compassion is Andy Smallman. He's been doing this for 15 years. Has a school in Seattle dedicated the Puget Sound Community School that teaches kindness. And he's running the IKT, the International Kindness Team. And each day for the games, each person who is a secret agent of compassion will receive a mission. And they'll go out into the community, again, starting from within, performing acts of kindness and compassion and sharing them with us. People at any time can do random acts. People can participate in service projects. And remember the conditions for collective impact. So we have a shared vision. We do have a shared way of measuring. And that's on this reports that you see here. It talks about submit and share reports. We have a compassion map. And here I think I have a picture of it. Yeah. And people can put these reports up onto the map. It's very simple to do. You can do it from a smartphone or from an email. And we have now probably almost 200 reports. I took this picture when it first started. But people have been submitting reports with videos and with photographs and with links. And they're examples of compassion in action. And what you can do is when you submit these reports, because during 9-11 to 9-21, those reports are going to be used to feed into the leaderboard. You can report on the number of volunteers, the number of hours of service, the dollars you raise for nonprofits, as well as the number of people that are served. So the vision that we have is creating this measurement of compassionate action. But more important than the measure is really the inspiration that will come from elevating those things that are working. And there are so many incredible stories and examples, my gosh. In fact, we're just posting a blog post today about some of those stories. But this is the idea of having a compassion map as a way to express what we're doing collectively. And at the same time, you should know that our movement to get other cities around the world is really taking off. The mayor of Louisville, Greg Fisher, introduced, and this was unanimously agreed upon just recently in June at the US Conference of Mayors, this resolution of compassion as an effective public policy. That's happening at the same time that this movement is growing of other communities stepping forward. And we're also preparing in 2015 for this World Compassion Festival happening at the same time as the Compassion Games. It will be the 80th birthday of the Dalai Lama. And we have a confirmation from a dear beloved brother and friend named Ben Haggerty. Everyone in the world knows him as Macklemore. He's from Seattle as well. And um, it's going to be an incredible uh, expression of collective impact, having 100 cities around the world connected Again, it will happen sometime between 9-11 and 9-21, and it's going to be um, part of this World Compassion Initiative that's emerging. So I'm going to pause here, Molly. This is um, a good moment, I think, to kind of let folks ponder what we're talking about here and ask any questions they have. Of course, as you saw, the whole vision that we have is we love the idea of the golden rule, but I think the challenge we all face is how do we bring this into life? And how do we go from the golden rule to the golden reality? Oh, that's superb. Thank you so much, Sean. We've been getting uh, comments all throughout your presentation. People are very happy and, and eager to communicate with you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask everyone who has a question or a comment um, to, to notify me. And I'm opening the questions panel right now. And when I see that there are, there are interesting questions, I'm going to try and call on everyone because we do have enough time um, for, a, for a pretty robust Q&A. So, uh, so I see hands in the air. Um, and first, I'm going to go to Eileen Epperson, who is uh, an ambassador of the parliament. She's on the advisory council. So she helps all of our ambassadors promoting the parliament. And now with our, with our strong interest and support of the Charter for Compassion, I know uh, we're going to see that extended into uh, her neighborhood in, uh, I think, Connecticut. Eileen, are you with us? Thank you. Can you hear me, Molly? We can hear you, bright and clear. Good Wonderful. morning. Good morning. Good morning. I am sitting here just um, glowing with excitement. John, you are just mm. inspiring. Oh, I have 
Uh, really. Um, so one comment, which is that I know Sandy Hart, and I am starting a campaign um, now to have the northwest corner of Connecticut and its little towns, my town, become a town of compassion. Mm. Um, we have uh, meetings set up. We have things happening in the library. And um, I have a vision of Connecticut becoming a state of compassion and cities across Connecticut, including Newtown, uh, becoming towns and cities of compassion. So I'm very excited about this. My question, and it may be too premature, is it is um, we're looking, hopefully, to have a parliament in 2015. And um, is there any thought about combining these two events, or just if they may just both happen in the same year? Or maybe that's not a question you can even answer right now, either of you. But I just I was so struck with that coincidence of mm -hmm. 100 cities of compassion by 2015 and celebrating the Dalai Lama's birthday. His 80th birthday, too. Yeah, I love that, Eileen. So I don't know what the dates are for the parliament. Are they set yet? So I can feel that I can feel that question. No, they are not set yet, and we are very eager and anxious to figure out how we can integrate the Compassion of Cities plan into our plans. Of course, of course. Well, certainly we're interested in that. And you know, there are folks in Newtown, Eileen, and efforts happening. Uh, we should talk about in Connecticut that you should be aware of. So do yes. reach out to me through Sandy, and I'll fill you in, and we can talk more about that. Very good. I'd love to partner around the Council for Equality and World Religions. Know that okay. we're totally committed to working together in any shape or form that we can. That's great. That's great. I've been to Newtown. It's already a city of compassion. Um, and I think um, it could be more public. And I'd love to talk with you offline. All right. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Eileen. So now I'm going to turn to uh, Rebecca Tobias, uh, who you know well. Um, and I'm going to ask Rebecca, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Can you oh, hear me? fantastic. Good morning. Oh, thank you. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Hey, Rebecca. Good morning. Happy belated birthday to you, Rebecca. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, you know, this is really um, a terrific uh, program, and we're watching it grow here in Southern California. And now we've uh, got all these cities online. What's the one thing, John, that all of us um, as a team of cities can do to make this easier uh, to communicate to our, our people who are interested? Is it, the, is it the secret agent of compassion? Or is it looking, at, looking to see what, um, what, what compassion gallery events or, or, or programs are, that they can participate in? Right. What is the one easiest way? You know, the secret agent thing seems to be the really easiest thing people can do. So everyone who wants to play should go to the site. You can sign up. And once you've signed up, you will receive, I'm, looking, I'm showing my screen. I don't know if it's still showing, but I'm just showing people the page where they can find out about the secret agent of compassion. And we have also events up here. So if you're a community that's in the games, you can add your events here. But anybody can participate wherever they are by simply joining up, and you know, you'll receive a mission. So I think that's the easiest thing. And then share it on the Compassion Map. I mean, the idea there is to elevate what all the good that people are discovering and doing. And I'll tell you one brief story from last year that just changed my life. I mean, this is such a great example. A young man in Seattle got onto a bus, and um, you can see this is the map I'm showing you here, the Compassion Map, and it's actually a global expression. So if folks are listening from all over, you can see stories being submitted all over. But this young man gets on this bus, and a panhandler comes on the bus. And he figured that he'd make himself invisible. This is Daniel Wynn, the young man, by putting his earbuds in. So perhaps he wouldn't be asked for money by the panhandler. But sure enough, the panhandler comes up to him and asks him for money, and Daniel says he doesn't have any money. But then Daniel's thinking about it. He said, you know, I do have some money, but I bet if I give him the money, he's probably going to go buy drugs or booze with it. So Daniel decides to ask him what's he going to do with the money. So he goes up to the guy, and he says to the guy, he asks him his name. The guy says his name is Reggie. And he says, well, Reggie, you know, I have some money, but I wonder what you do with it. What do you do with the money? And Reggie says to him, well, what are you, a cop? And Daniel says, no, 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 I'm not a cop, but I'm just curious. I'm interested. He says, okay, I'll tell you. 
says, I give it to homeless youth. Well, Daniel says, you know, he didn't believe him. So he waits till the guy leaves the bus, and Daniel sneaks out and follows him. And the guy walks to a house and goes into this house, and Daniel waited outside. He says, for about a half hour, the guy didn't come out. He goes into the house, and he realizes it's a shelter. And he goes up to this woman at the desk where he first walked in, and he asks her, he says, do you know Reggie? And she says, oh, do you mean Reginald? Pointing to his picture on the wall, he's our most frequent donor. Mm -hmm. I love that story. That's a great story, John. That story really opened my eyes to the possibility that maybe everything isn't just the way I think it is. And <laughs> every time I've ever seen anybody panhandling or on the streets, I wonder if that's Reggie. And the reason why this map is so meaningful to me is because of this possibility of elevation. And Rebecca, you know this well. I mean, from sharing these kinds of stories, we can grow our own understanding of what compassionate action is and how that shows up for us in our everyday lives. So playing secret agent of compassion. We're also going to introduce this other game in the next day or so called Compassion Tag, that you can play with your Facebook friends. But we want people to get out in the community. Obviously, this is in response to the sense of social isolation and disconnection that so many people are feeling right now, and especially for youth and what we need to do to make real the visions that we hold and the the commitment that we have to treat each other with respect and with kindness. So thank you, Rebecca. And I don't know if there's more you want to talk about because you have so much important things to say. So it's an honor to work with you. It's an honor to be together, all of us to be together. Yeah, yeah. Let's see if there's some other questions. And then I, I would have things to say, but let's hear it if there are any, so any other questions. Sure. Thank, thank you, thank Thanks, you Rebecca. Uh, so. Valerie Gurley has asked if we can do a refresher on um, the steps. I'm going to unmute Valerie. Valerie, are you with uh, us? Valerie Gurley, are you there? So, so she's asking for a refresher on, on the steps. Um, I think that was a slide earlier. <laughs> well, it's right here on the home page. So I think, yeah, I have a picture of it, but actually on the home page it's active and it's uh, here are the four steps. So for Valerie and anyone else who's interested, the idea here is that people can be a player, right? So you can say I want to sign up and either be a secret agent of compassion or be an organizer and organize an activity or a game within your community. The whole idea is to get people out promoting compassionate action. So you can be a player, you can be an organizer, organizing a game or organizing a community. Now it's a week away, so if anyone wants to do it, it's going to take a lot of work, but we can do it. We'll support you. Once you've committed, then the idea is to play the games. So of course, do this every day of the year, wherever you are, but during these 11 days is when we're going to be counting so that we have this co-opetition in play, right? So being a secret agent, doing random acts, participating in service projects. And I'll show you what those projects are in a minute because there's a whole event calendar where people can come and find out about those. Then report on what you've done. So put those up onto the compassion map so others can see them and then share them and put them out via social media, et cetera. Check out that leaderboard. And then we're going to be celebrating because the last day of the games is the International Day of Peace. And we're looking to do everything we can to strengthen and support that. There's so many remarkable people who've been working on that for years. Our whole vision with this being part of the 11 days of global unity is just like it said in the leadership lessons from the dancing guy, to be a first follower for all these great things we're doing. The event calendar is really straightforward in that you can see the events happening in your community or you can see them in all communities. This is how this works. So I clicked on events. And right now it's showing the events throughout all the different communities. But if I say, let's just see the Seattle events, it's going to filter these events. And in fact, it was just this art party we had to prepare. We're going to put these banners across the interstate that say, love wins, compassion games. And then tonight, there's this event. We're preparing. We're connected with the tribes, as I was saying. There's some challenges here to our beautiful Salish Sea. We're working to make that North America's first international bioregional marine sanctuary. We can talk more about that. But then each of these events are happening throughout the games. So if there are service projects and activities that people want to promote, 
that's the other way. These are a great way to get volunteers engaged. This is an incredible film, by the way, that's being launched in a number of cities. And I hope New York and L.A. are planning to have it because it's during the games. The Muslims are coming. And if you guys don't know about this, it's hilarious and inspiring and really has a way of getting at the Islamophobia that is, uh, you know, that so many people are suffering from. And it's really beautiful, great example of what we can do with art and creativity. So these are the events that are happening uh, during the Compassion Games and examples of the kind of things. There's one thing here, this resource exchange is also, I hate to share this with you guys, but this is part of the, the truth, is this Seattle stand down, this event here, which I'll open up, is um, connected to the fact that on, we did a homeless count in Seattle and found that 800 of the homeless folks that are on the streets of Seattle are veterans, and a third of them are women. And it's just hard to believe, but I hate to say it, this is the situation we find ourselves in. So the service projects that people can do, these events, this is where they can find those. So again, on the home page, if you go here, you can scroll down to the, Valerie was asking about, I think this image here, committing, playing, reporting, and rejoicing. Those are really the four steps to celebrate what we've accomplished and appreciate what we've accomplished. And, um, you know, if you're interested in organizing an event within a community that's participating and you can see which of those communities are right here, or if you still want to organize your community, don't hesitate to reach out. Anything we can do to be supportive, that's what we're here for. Oh, fantastic. So now I see a question from one of our participants. His name is, uh, or her name is Harvins Lai. Lau, Harvins, are you with us? Are you with us? Uh, after this webinar, will you send us by email the important links where we can get material, educational material, and other material? Yes, yes. Molly, let's make sure that happens. I want that. Yes, absolutely. I, I've Thank collected you. all of your all of your contact, and um, I will make sure that you're signed up for updates and and reference materials. Um, so. Maybe we can talk a little bit about um, the existing service events that are taking place in the community from the 11th to the 21st. This was a suggestion from Rebecca. Um, mm -hmm. Can you can you give us uh, some examples? You have some events there shown on the screen. Right. Well, what you could do is, depending upon where you are, if I drop this down, so if I want to take a look at what's happening in Orange County, right, or Los Angeles, I don't know if you guys want me to pick a particular one, but that's how it works, right? So now I can see these are events that are being planned to take place during the, the 21st in Los Angeles. If I click on Orange County, it'll actually still keep Los Angeles and it'll add Orange County. So you guys can put some combination if you want to. They've got, every community's doing a food drive. So in uh, Orange County, they're doing Move Your Compassion Can. And there's a Peace Dove Walk and there's a Recycling Compassion. All of these events are happening in Orange County and Los Angeles. So as, and more events I know are being added as we speak here. So there's stuff happening in Montreal as well, and if I click on Montreal and turn off Los Angeles, hmm. we'll see. Hold on, I think I turned off Montreal. So it's a really nice way to kind of display these. And you can see them, not only they call this a poster board, but you can just see them as a long list, or you can see them on the calendar. So depending upon, you know, what, uh, what your preference is, you can view them different ways. Fantastic. We have to get Chicago on that list. I know, I know. Come on. What do you guys I'm... really, you know, how compassionate are you? In fact, that's part of the thrill and joy of this. There's something about tapping into that competitive spirit in us to rise. In fact, I love this quote when we found it from Martin Luther King. We couldn't help but put it right on the home page. Hopefully you're going to see it here in a second. Keep feeling the need for being first. But I want you to be first in love. I want you to be first in moral excellence. I want you to be first in generosity. So we're looking to reframe this idea of games and competition to really uh, challenge us to bring out our very best. Mm -hmm. And learn from each other. So Stephen Sideroff has a question, uh, hand raised. Hand Stephen, are you with us? Stephen, are you with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Welcome. Absolutely welcome. 
Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Steve Sideroff from the Raul Wallenberg Institute of Ethics here in Los Angeles. And I, I, I think this is such a brilliant, brilliant idea, and it's, uh, I'm just uh, thrilled to be a part of it. So thank you all very much. Uh, <clears throat> one question I have is um, I have a, uh, uh, a brilliant uh, rapper who ha is interested in being involved. And I was trying to come up with the best way for his brilliance to shine uh, through this, um, the compassion games that we're doing. And I'm, I'd love uh, any suggestions that you might have. Yeah, well, we're going to be doing at Cleveland High School uh, break dance and rap. So maybe you can bring him to the opening or closing ceremony or any of the events you have. Right? Yeah, he, he was planning to be in L.A. sometime during this period, but his plans changed. But um, I'm still trying to find a good way for him to be involved. Okay, well, he could, he could record him. We could put him on the compassion map. Yes, that's what I was thinking of doing, yeah. Stephen, yeah. by the way, thank you for your support with the Wallingberg Center. It's a great institution down there, and Sandy and Rebecca have shared with me the great work that you guys are doing. We're thrilled that you're involved. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, I'm, we're looking forward to the 11th. Well, game on. I know you guys are fierce competitors. I, I didn't mention this earlier. I love to tell people this, but Louisville is so compassionate. They said they were going to come out to Seattle to help us beat them. <laughs> so, really, you, guys, you guys are going to have to really, you know, we're all going to have to flex our compassion muscles here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask if anyone has any more questions. I see Rebecca has her hand up. Rebecca, do you have any comments or questions? There is a, 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 a lot more on around me, so I, I'm just going to type my questions in. It's very loud. Sorry. Sorry. I'm not hearing feedback. Don't worry. You're you're saying that you're hearing you're feedback. Hearing feedback. Yes. She's hearing feedback, but she's hearing a lawnmower. Oh. Okay. Yes, a lawnmower. Oh, lawnmower. It's very loud. Yeah. Well, we can't hear it. No. But cutting people's grass, <laughs> one of an act of compassion you can do. If you have a neighbor who's uh, not well or unable to take care of their yard. Here, here's some questions that I've got some, some folks had asked me. If they're not in one of these cities that's listed on, on the pull down yet, how can they, how can they um, be recognized for their acts of, of kindness and compassion? Can they still enter it into the map? Oh, yeah, absolutely, oh, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's right. So if they're looking to be a part of that collective expression, the map is an ideal way to do that. And uh, you do not need to be associated with any particular organization or community to be able to be from the compassion map. So we definitely encourage people to do that. So everyone involved in a service, service project or, or act of kindness can plug and play. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. It's really easy to go here to submit a report. Just a couple of fields. We want to get a title, description, and they don't have to be in the community, but if they're in a community, it'll be here one to choose from. They could just say it's a story or a random act or a service project. They could say they're an individual, and if they want to add the number of volunteers and hours, that's all they got to do. They don't even have to disclose their information, their name, if they don't want to. It's optional. But they can't put in a link here or video or photo. It, we do want to know where they are so we can see them on the map, and that's it. So I hear that uh, Sandy Hart has a proposal. Um, it's very interesting, and it sounds very exciting. So I'm going to ask Sandy to join us. Sandy? Sandy, are you with Aloha. us? Aloha. Aloha, Sandy. Okay, so Sandy must be preoccupied, but okay, I'm going to go ahead. Oh, she's here. She's oh, hi, Sandy. Hi, I couldn't unmute myself. Sorry. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, John, for that wow, really comprehensive, really great, really exciting and inspirational presentation. Um, 
you never cease to amaze me with your enthusiasm and your tireless dedication to this. Um, and your fancy filled creativity. It's so much fun to watch you at work. So so fun to play with you. Thank you. Same here. So um, I'm, I'm also with a women's community building organization here in Orange County. And we found this collective model, although we didn't call it a collective model. We didn't know it was a, co a collective impact model. Um, but we found that um, a really effective way of, of, of convening our interfaith community and developing new bridges and pathways for interfaith collaboration and, and cooperation was through community service. And we had been out doing panel discussions and educational opportunities and community dialogues. But that only took us so far and we got so many people to the table. But it was that community service component that really inspired folks from all corners of the community to come out. And there we were cross-pollinating our interfaith community to really get to know one another. And we found that that really helped us um, develop really strong interfaith relations in our community. And then when we introduced the Compassion Games to, to it, and, and like you said, John, we already had this weekend of community service at play, and we were going into our fifth year, and all we did was the simple little tweak of adding the competition or the co-opetition factor to it. And boy, did more and more faith institutions want to play all of a sudden. Um, and uh, they were getting really creative on how they upped their game now that we added a point system to their, uh, to their, uh, to their service. And it really brought out seriously the best and the most creative energies. And um, you know, I've said this before and I'll say it again, the mosques were in it to win it and to prove how compassionate they were. And they really did. They really um, outnumbered all of the different faith institutions, which only further inspired the other institutions, to, uh, the only faith communities to want to step it up um, in the games coming up now. And so um, I have, uh, this was actually not my idea. I think it was yours, John. But I'm, I'm honored to make this challenge. Um, I think it's time that the interfaith, um, the, the interfaith networks cooperate together. I'd like to see the United Religions Initiative and the Parliament of the World's Religions and the North America Interfaith Network and Religions for Peace and everybody out there who is responsible for a whole network of interfaith um, uh, grassroots organizations to find a creative way to compete in in the games. What do you think of that? I love that. I mean, in fact, you know, we've seen this start to happen, the shift network, challenging, evolving wisdom, um, that there's something really sweet and powerful about that. And um, Yes, I'd love to see that. I'd love to see the different faith-based interspiritual organizations challenge each other. And let's see who is the most compassionate interspiritual, interfaith organization in, in the world. I mean, the joy, I mean, this is, look, the, 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 the essence of this, there's a beautiful book written by James Kapars about this idea of infinite games, okay? And I know that some people at first say, what? Competing to be compassionate? But it's such an interesting reframe because he talks about there are finite games that are win-lose games. And then there are infinite games. That the point of an infinite game is not to have winners or losers. But in infinite games, the more people play, the more people win. And with a finite game, you play within boundaries. But with an infinite game, you play with boundaries. So here we are redefining the boundaries. In fact, Sandy told us an incredible story recently about our volunteer chaplain who got a warden in a women's institution, a correctional facility in California, to play the Compassion Games. So there's really no limit to what we can do here. And whatever it's going to take to really take us all to the next level of engagement, if it is kind of wondering how URI can out 
outperform the Council for Parliament of World Religions by being more compassionate. I can't imagine a better use of our time and energy. So I love that, Sandy. I think it's really, you know, ha nobody loses in that game. Oh, and that's all right. Win. That's right. I, and maybe we can all meet on Facebook and start um, getting creative about how this can happen. I would love it. And nothing would make. I mean, Sandy, you have brought so much to this vision, and having people show up, and everybody's welcome. I encourage you guys: do not behave like you're a stranger here. We cannot <laughs> afford it. It's time to come forward and know each other. And by knowing this network, we can knit this network, and we can come up with these ways to reinvent the boundaries and redefine what it is to be a compassionate part of this movement. So thank you for that. And I don't know who's, you know, how you feel, Molly, and if you can speak on behalf of the council, but you guys have been challenged. We have been challenged and I'm up for the for, for the challenge. I'm going into a staff meeting in about an hour, but the thing is, I mean, we have such compassionate, wonderful leaders. They live and breathe it every day. I don't even think that there's a scoring system that exists that could that could quantify how much compassion comes out of the work of our executive director and our board of trustees. Ah, uh -huh. wow. What a bold claim. <laughs> so it's like you're warning, you're warning URI. Uh, I'm so not warning. Out. No, we, I, I, you know, <laughs> see, they're so busy doing compassionate acts, traveling. I'm, I'm going to need to, to coordinate with some uh, fellow organizations just to show me the ropes. So. And Molly, I'll help you. I'll help you beat us. Right. Thank you so much. You yes, go. well, I'm I'm determined. My 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 coopetition is with uh, fellow Chicagoans because I'm just shamed uh -huh. and and I think it's pathetic that we don't have a presence. And I'm going to change that. And uh, I did share the compassion games privately with my own Facebook network last night, and I was able to encourage some of my personal friends to participate. So it should be quite easy here in the office. Um, I'm gonna there. I'm gonna then um, ask one more uh, person to speak, Saeed Ahmed, who is uh, emeritus trustee of the Parliament of the World's Religions, and uh, wow. he has some comments. And if he's uh, unable to share, I can go ahead and share them for him. Saeed, are you with us? Yes. Oh, welcome. Welcome, Saeed. I, I I was reading your comments. And um, I was wondering if you would like to share anything before we close the webinar? Well, I have already spoken about my thoughts, uh, the form of comments which I have already written to you. You can read it out and we'll give okay. you everything there. Okay. Thank you very much for conducting such a wonderful session. And my uh, congratulations uh, to the presenter. And he is uh, very clear and has got a very clear concept of where we should go from here. Yes, and and thank you for reminding me that that the principles of compassion are so central to the Parliament's mission. I think I, I try and live and breathe that every day in my work, but it's always nice to have that reminder of the the, the synergies that exist, um, and that thank we're you. all we're all, all very very much closely working for the same goal, and that is. That is a better life um, for all. Hope, hope I would be having an opportunity to see you in your office someday. Absolutely. You're welcome. Anytime. I'll, I'll be happy to follow up with you when we're, when we're through here. Um, so I'm going to put, put out a call for um, comments or questions before we close the webinar. Please just let me know if you have something you'd like to add. I want to thank uh, John Raymer for speaking late at night with me last week to get this planned, for, for rising to the occasion with very short notice for being welcoming to the parliament and for being um, a first follower. Really, I haven't known anyone to top. Um, and the wonderful collaboration and enthusiasm of Sandy Hart and Rebecca Tobias from United Religious Initiatives that have been working so, so closely and, and passionately to promote this. I think it's going to be wildly successful. And it's, it's comforting to see the likes of Oprah Winfrey. And, um, and, and the chances for this succeeding are just infinite. So thank you so much. Um, so I want to say uh, you're welcome um, at any point to contact me. My email address is molly at parliamentofreligions.org. I am responsive and, and very communicative. I also run the Parliament's Facebook page at uh, Parliament of Religions. Uh, you're welcome to communicate with us there. And um, People are calling you right now, Molly. You're so communicative. Look at that. I, I'm not sure. That might, be, that might be um, one of our, one of our attendees. 
Yeah, so, that's so, how you... ev so everyone is still with us. Um, I want to plug a couple of upcoming webinars that we're doing. Uh, on September 30th, we have an interesting webinar coming out of my obsession with interfaith activism on the internet. Uh, I connected with a group out of the Interfaith Center of New York that has sponsored a new website called Exodus Conversations. And it's a, it's a website, it's social, and it's also um, educational around 16 questions that arise out of the Exodus story um, and the, the Haggadah. Um, there's three scholars of Abrahamic faith, Jewish, Muslim, and Christian, that respond to 16 critical questions and then invite on a weekly basis um, users to participate in conversation around a weekly theme. So around the time of Ramadan, um, they spoke very, very deeply and uh, personally about their commitments to uh, diet. They've spoken about um, their, their interpretations of grief. Um, it's, it's a very interesting approach to uh, cultivating interreligious dialogue online. So they're going to be with us talking about that resource on September 30th. Um, and then as an extension of uh, our youth series, we're going to be doing a webinar with someone from the American Teachers Federation on the school to prison pipeline. And another one with some uh, fantastic dynamic leaders out of Detroit who have developed a new sense of leadership training called tectonic leadership that seeks to address the tension that exists in interfaith dialogue and bring it to the fore and use it as an asset in community building. It's especially uh, useful for youth. So those two webinars will be coming up and you'll be receiving invitations for them um, from me. I want to thank everyone again. I want to wish everyone to have a great day and to wish them good luck in the Compassion Games and uh, let you all know that there will be a recording of this webinar, um, flaws and all, technical <laughs> difficulty, and uh, I am so happy to have uh, created this community today and I look forward to speaking again with you. And John, I just want to ask, do you have any closing remarks? Yes. Sure. Thank you, Molly. Okay. Thank you, everyone for your participation in making the world a more just, sustainable, peaceful, and compassionate place. I look forward to meeting with you sometime soon. Very good. So good luck with the Compassion Games. And here, here, I accept your challenge. And you'll be seeing a Facebook update from the Parliament very soon uh, with our plan. So also, I want to remind that the Parliament is celebrating its 20th anniversary of the 1993 Parliament and the 120th anniversary of the 1893 Parliament here in Chicago on November 16th. So please let me know if you're interested in sharing time with us uh, through an anniversary benefit celebration. Um, and I also want to plug that the 11th of September, wh wh where, it, where you have used it to launch such a successful um, positive action campaign, is also the anniversary of the 1893 Parliament speech delivered by Swami Vivekananda, which was very much central uh, to the birth of the interfaith movement. So look forward to communicating more with you about that. And I wish you all, again, a very lovely and compassionate day. Thank you.